Okay, wonderful. I remember just in time to hit record. All right. So again, like I said, my name is Sophia Prater. All things OAUX over here. I run Rewired UX, OAUX.com, the certification, and basically teach OAUX, do OAUX, bring OAUX to my clients in the form of Orca Sprints. And I use something called the NOM a lot, the nested object matrix. And the nested object matrix is all about exploring relationships as a form of problem solving. And not just problem solving, like innovation and realizing problems you didn't even know you had or realizing questions you didn't even know you had. It's a great tool to come up with questions. So Rachel Levenger, who we all love and her amazing article, Content Strategy and the Philosophy of Data from like 2011, she said, there are many factors that determine whether something is meaningful, but the primary one, at least as far as web applications is concerned, is relationships. 100% agree. I would actually take it a step farther and say that Basically, to determine if anything is meaningful is just the relationships, not just web applications, just life in general. Um, our, our girl, Ada Lovelace, the designer of the first algorithm, she said, all and everything is naturally related and interconnected. Y'all, everything is connected. We don't understand anything <laughs> except for in relation to something we already understand. And I don't actually have that written down. I probably butchered it a little bit. Um, let me know in the chat. Does anybody know who said that one? <laughs> pop quiz, internet history. Who said that? The only, I'm trying, I'm, I'm like, somebody remind me. Yeah, Rachel Saul Warman. Thank you. Thank you. Silverio. Silverio. Yes. Good hint. Yeah. Richard Saul Warman. Um, so everything is connected, y'all, and mapping connections is so important and so overlooked in our industry. So how does this nested object matrix fit into this overall work of process? So all right, I know a lot of y'all have seen this slide a million times, but I'm going to show it again just in case we got, we, I know we got some new people here. So we, the OUXers, we answer these questions before we design a single screen. What are the objects in the user's mental model? What are the objects' relationships to each other? What calls to action do objects offer users? And what are the attributes that make up the objects? And this aligns to the most lovely acronym in the whole world, Orca. Okay. And that is the process. That is the process that we teach within the OUX world. OUX is kind of a philosophy. Orca, not kind of. OUX is a philosophy. It's a theory. It's a theory that people think in objects and uh, people think in objects. We've got to make those objects clear in digital spaces because that's what they're expecting from their physical space. And they take that same brain evolved in the physical space and they apply it to digital spaces and they can't tell what anything is <laughs> because we break the laws of physics often when we're designing in screens because we're just using pixels. So Orca, so OUX is the philosophy, Orca is the process. So this Orca process is robust, we'll say, robust, it is four rounds. So this first round, we hit all four of these pillars and we go through discovery, um, we go through the discovery while we look at what are the objects, how do they all connect to each other, what do people do to those objects, and what are the attributes? It's kind of a very high level to really pull out um, amazing questions. Then we go into requirements where we really dig in. We go through those four pillars again, and then we go into prioritization, where then we prioritize the O's, the R's, the C's, and the A's. Then we pull it all together into pretty low fidelity screens to hand off the higher fidelity design. Okay, and to also UI design and also task flows and interaction design and all that other good stuff. So I like to say that this process really does fit really nicely between the two diamonds. It's kind of like a third diamond. And I got an article on that. Go check it out on Medium on the, the third the third diamond in the design process. Uh, we will often remix this. We will pick and choose a... Um, a, a pro OUXer is basically taking all of these bits and remixing them and applying them and mashing them up with what they're already doing. Okay. So it feels like a lot here, but this is a very flexible and very scalable process. We're just going to be talking about the nom, 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 the nested object matrix, which lives in that second step, traditionally second step of relationship discovery. So relationship discovery has two main activities. We've got system modeling, which is all our back boxes and arrows. You might know this is like a entity relationship diagram or um, a content model where you have things and how all the things are connected. Now, system modeling is really, really great. <laughs> and the nested object matrix does a lot of the same things, but 
the context that we use these are is a little bit different. So the system modeling is really good for high level, big picture, the main relationships, the main objects. Once you start getting to a system that's got like 10 objects or 20 objects or 100 objects, and there might be multiple relationships between multiple things, you very quickly end up with a bowl of spaghetti and thing that is actually pretty difficult to read. Also, it's very, it's very difficult to do a gap analysis. Have I thought through all the potential connections here? It's not as systematic, all right? The nested object matrix basically takes those boxes and arrows and puts them in a matrix so we can explore all connections as well as recursive connections as well. How does a thing relate to itself? <laughs> Just fun. So the nested object matrix is exhaustive. We can even get questionable conceptual relationships in there because then this is gonna actually provide the foundation for our object map, which then we can prioritize later. So then we can prioritize these relationships and kind of move them around, which is a beautiful thing. All right, so if we look at an object, a detail page of an object on meetup.com, we have the group object, all right? Object-oriented object -oriented UX happy hour. It's like hard to get out. OUX happy hour is an instance of the group object on meetup.com. All right, so if I'm looking at this group, I can start to see some nested objects. Let me know in the chat, what are some nested objects within the group object? Yes, Jonathan, members. And there's one more that really stands out here. Mm -hmm. Members, organizers, events. Awesome. Okay. So we actually have, we have uh, a group has one to many events that are, uh, that are upcoming. This actually should probably be zero to many, right? You can easily have a, a group that doesn't have any upcoming events. Um, and then you also have, um, oh my gosh, my Zoom Chrome is in the way. Um, you also have, has zero to many events that are in the past. We also have, has, I would actually say, instead of saying has one organizer and has one member, <laughs> I would actually say has one user with organizer from, or has one to many, in this case, many, has one to many users with organizer permissions and has one to many users with member permissions. And that gets us all into object relative roles, which is fun stuff that is not for today. Okay, so we have a host object and we have nested objects. Here's an example that you might be familiar with if you have seen the Udemy course. Uh, we've got a YouTube video as an object. We've got has one creator. And to follow the rule that I just talked about, I should probably say has one user who created it. Um, has zero to, or this might be a channel. Ooh, creator, channel. Is that the same thing? Is that a different thing? User versus channel. Um, mm, can one user have multiple channels? Mm, questions are starting to come up just in thinking about the relationships between the things. Uh, a YouTube video has zero to many comments and has many related videos. So video related to video based on relatedness. Okay, so this can actually go into a column starting to look a little bit object mappy. And so what the nested object matrix does is it takes your objects down the Y axis and across the X axis. And then you can fill in the blanks. Now in traditional, traditional OAUX, no such thing. And <laughs> the way that we are currently teaching the OAUX process, we are really focusing on cardinality too, okay? Which we're not gonna talk about too much in this talk with, is where we actually talk about putting instances in the nested object matrix. We'll get to that in a second. But the nested object matrix is pretty cool because then if you need to extend it, you need to add an object, which in a system model, <laughs> add one and it's like, oh, I have to draw the arrows to all the other things. You can easily add an object, you add it to the x-axis, you add it to the y-axis, and you play it through, right, to map all those relationships. You can also easily have multiple relationships. This scales really, really nicely, whether you're in sticky notes, it scales, or whether you're in something like Notion or Airtable, which we often use, then this scales really nicely. You can have all the different relationships between two things mapped out, where if I put even just this four by four with all these relationships, if I put that into a system model, which I should do, I should show y'all. Hmm, I'm not going to do that now. But just imagine what this would look like as a system model. It would be pretty unreadable. You might be thinking, if this is your first time looking at a nested object matrix, you're like, ah, this is kind of unreadable. All you got to do is you read it as a sentence. 
comment has one creator. A comment has zero to many replies. A playlist has one creator. A playlist has one to many videos inside of it. Read it like a sentence. Oh, there's another one. Okay, so a nested object matrix is an object by object matrix that gives us space to methodically explore all potential relationships between objects. The host objects are listed across the x-axis, we call the host, and then this exact same objects are listed down the y-axis, um, creating rows, all right? And this creates the foundation for our object map. Then we basically fill in our core content, we fill in our metadata, and each of these columns becomes basically a prototype for a detail screen and start showing all that connect contextual uh, navigation. So I can start seeing if I've got a channel I have all the playlists that I've created. I can click on a playlist. I can see uh, the creator of the playlist. I can click on a playlist. I can see the videos pop back over there. X-ray vision. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. So that's nomming to use a, to turn it into a verb. That is nomming objects. What if we nommed the instances? <laughs> All right, fun stuff. So objects versus instances, I'll often describe objects as the cookie cutter, the templates, and YouTube, that would be video, playlist, channel. Um, instances are the cookies, the stuff that gets actually churned out by that object. So if video is the object, 10 minute upper body shred cha challenge could be the video. All right, if channel is the object, Chloe Ting might be an instance. Did I say that right? Video would be an object. 10 minute upper body sh summer shred would be the instance. Okay. Cool. All right. So what if we nomed instances? Well, let's just take two of the things to be very meta that we just broke down. We've got happy hour, right? Meetup uh, group, right? So happy hour, the OUX happy hour being an instance of a group. Um, and then we got YouTube. So if I'm looking at this in the context of my world, these are actually instances of channels or even systems. I like channels is good. We've got YouTube as a channel and I've got happy hour. And I'm thinking about this kind of from a marketing perspective, okay? So I've got these two channels. And what happens if I make, if I make a little, little nom, little, little nested object matrix, I put YouTube nested and happy hour nested. And I start thinking about the intersections between these. All right, YouTube to YouTube. All right, asking for follows, right? <laughs> you gotta say, hey, follow me. If I'm making a YouTube video, how do I zhuzh up more YouTube videos? And how do I cross-reference YouTube videos? Hey, you're watching, doing the little card, asking for follows, doing the little card thing, which I don't know, I still haven't figured out on YouTube. Can't be that hard, but like, hey, watch this other video next. I know you've seen people do that. All right, that would be that recursive strategy. Um, how does happy hour manifest under YouTube. If I'm on YouTube, right, and I want to get, or you're on YouTube, and I want to get you over to happy hour, well, I should be pointing to those recordings. Another thing I should probably do is link happy hour in the videos. So one thing that we realized just through doing this, we were like, you know, we post happy hour recordings, like this recording is going to get posted to YouTube. Hi, if you're on YouTube, um, this is going to get posted to YouTube. And one thing that we often don't do is in the notes, be like, hey, if you want to come to the next live <laughs> happy hour, if you want to join happy hour, here's the link to www.meetup.com slash OAUX happy hour. We don't do that right now. We had to do this silly little matrix. I mean, it sounds so silly, but we're not marketing people. But even if you are a marketing person, imagine this, all the channels by all the channels. How do all the channels talk to each other? And I'm going to show a bigger version of this later. So point to the recordings, point people back to happy hour. Huh, yeah, I actually had a linking to happy hour in all videos. Put people back to sign up for it. Call to action, right? Um, and then under the happy hour, how do we push people to YouTube? So posting the recordings on YouTube, which we're doing, but do I often, I don't really send y'all a follow-up for like the, how many people are here? 46 people are here, 187 people signed up. Probably should make an effort to message everybody from happy hour and be like, here's the recording in case you missed it. Go over to, go over to YouTube. We can connect the dots here. All right. Um, happy hour to happy hour always mentioning the next happy hour, which we did. And we put the link in the show notes. But what about, what about mentioning the previous happy hour? Huh? 
y'all might have missed Mandy G's talk talking about OUX and games, and you might be interested in that. We had to do this matrix, so think about that. This should probably be part of every single happy hour as we say, oh, here's our next one that's coming up while y'all are here, captive audience. I know you, you can leave, but um, while you're here, here's the next one. Go ahead and sign up for it, even if it's just a placeholder, which if you did sign up for the next one, the government one you saw, there's just deep, literally... Uma and I put that together 10 minutes beforehand to be like, we need to be able to let you know that you can go ahead and sign up for it. We can also link you to the last one. All right. So actually, Luke, do you have that link? I do. So Luke's going to put that link in. We're going to actually make it happen right now. All right. So marketing strategy. Okay. OUXers. <laughs> the color coding purists. These should probably be in yellow because we're talking about instances. Forgive me. I made the entire presentation and then like 15 minutes ago, I was like, that should all be in yellow, but no worries. Let's think about these as instances. Oh, so asking you to rate the events. There's this new rating system now. You can rate it and it like shows like we have like four and a point seven stars or something. That's awesome. Please, if you're enjoying this, rate this happy hour. We should ask you to do that, right? Just remind you, please do that. Please tell us how we did. Okay. Noming project inches. I'm just going to give you all so many examples of it. That's just one example. All right. How do all the projects I have on my plate interact? Okay. You can do this for channels. You can do this for projects. Are there dependencies to these projects? Am I missing anything? So I did this recently, and I'm, you're going to see a lot of my really messy handwriting here. You're not, you probably can't read it, but I really wanted to show you how this is, this is, this is the level of fidelity that I did this in. And I got a couple, I highlighted a couple key things, and then that got pulled into my project management system. But as far as an nested object matrix, it just is a piece of paper. And I got projects across the x-axis. This was a couple months ago. I was wrapping up cohort eight. I was getting ready for cohort nine with an entirely new advanced track in cohort nine. Also working on our ebook that is as if you're if you're been on the newsletter for a while that we've been working on for like two and a half years. Um, and this other thing, this OUXing the business. So actually applying OUX to our business, getting our business processes and our automation set up from an OUX perspective, super fun stuff. And then we've got the same exact projects down the y-axis. And cool stuff happened when I started thinking about the dependencies. Am I missing anything? How can one thing even support the other thing? How can I potentially kill multiple birds with one stone? Right? Oh my goodness. Go back. Why did it go so fast? Okay. Whew. Don't sneeze. All right. So one thing was the OUX in the business and thinking about the, uh, the cohort nine advanced track is having a meetings object within our notion system. So one-on-ones can be tracked. Um, uh, the ebook, the ebook style guide, realizing like, oh my gosh, from OUX in the business perspective, our ebook has objects in it. It has quotes in it. It has resources in it. It has people that are mentioned in it. Um, it has exercises in it. It has objects within the ebook. And that actually should be documented in this like overarching OUX in the business strategy that we're doing. So all these interesting pieces came up through taking your project. So especially if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, like this was like, I'm feeling overwhelmed by all this stuff. Let me just map it out. Like how can also these things support each other? So this isn't about making more work per se. It's more about like, okay, how is one thing going to impact or, you know, or am I missing? Because should, should one thing happen before the other thing? Or can I kill two birds or three birds with one stone? Um, you can do this with house projects. So Luke and I did this recently. We already had the matrix on the left. You're probably familiar with a like a cost benefit matrix. We had all the projects we want to do at home, all our little home renovations and like, what's going to cost a lot, what's not going to cost a lot, what's easy, what's hard, okay? We took the five biggest ones that we were working on and thinking about that were kind of, we were honestly paralyzed and like, what do we do first, second, third, and fourth? Because they all seem to impact each other. And that's, this is when I was, I was like, oh, let's put it in the nested object matrix. Hell yeah. So we took, uh, we're trying to get our house on solar. We want to get a fence around our house. We got our get our retaining wall fixed. Um, we want to extend our guest room because our guest room is tiny and we want more guests to come visit us in the mountains. And we want a garage too. So we want to add a garage on. So we take these big macro projects, put them down the x-axis, put them down the y-axis, and then magic happens. You can see some things are just empty. It was like 30 second thought experiment. Nothing, nothing really there, but lots of really good stuff happened. So a couple things in order of operations that we should really do the fence and then the wall. All right. 
Um, actually, I think that's backwards. <laughs> we should do the wall and then the fence. <laughs> um, this is the big one. Making the wall, the retaining wall, or retaining wall redesign, making it child safe. So this wasn't really about the guest room per se. It was just in the mindset of thinking about having guests, thinking about re re uh, redoing the retaining wall, thinking about a lot of the guests that we have are going to be bringing small kids. Right now, our retaining wall is just like a drop off. So if we want, want to redo it, I was thinking we should have it like more graded and more stair steps of it so that it's more child safe or having like some sort of fencing around it. Um, does that actually play into the fence? Yes, it does. One thing that I will call out here. So one thing that trips people up when they first start using the nested object matrix is a, a potentially thinking that we have redundancies because we've got guest room and wall and then we've got wall and guest room. So like, are these two squares, am I like exploring the same thing? And the answer is no, especially if I'm thinking, how do these things impact this thing? So kind of like turning it into a sentence a little bit, thinking about this is the host, all right? And these are the, the things that are potentially being affected by it. Um, you end up thinking about it slightly differently. Sometimes there's nothing there, but actually what we ended up with this particular one with two different insights. So how the guest room affects the wall is actually gave us different um, insights than how the wall affects the guest room. Okay, so this is the same again with like the cardinality of, of this is my this is my system model dance here um, of how one thing relates to the other. You want to build those arrows both ways and explore it from both perspectives. You want to do this here too. I mean, you saw that also when I was exploring the channels, doing it one way versus the other way gave me different thoughts. Okay, if I'm thinking about happy hour, how does YouTube? nest in it. Like if I'm on happy hour, how do I push people to YouTube? If people are on YouTube, how do I push them to happy hour? Those are two different things. Okay. So this is where I would love to spend like a lot of my time. I haven't had a whole too, too much time. You can tell by all the empty blocks. I know it's tiny, tiny text, but this could be projects or products, or like I was saying before, channels or platforms. So we have a database in Notion, what I call machine parts. So they are like all the parts of our business. They're the products that we offer. They're the places that we say things. So YouTube channel, our newsletter, <laughs> Instagram, kind of, not really. Um, OUX happy hours. And this is, I think there's about 30 of them, actually. There's quite a bit. So this is like a 30 by 30 matrix here. Um, so you can set this up in Notion. Um, oh, we're not going to get into the technicalities of setting it up. But um, basically what we're doing is we have the host object, we have the nested object, you do a group by, and you can kind of make it into a matrix. And this is me going through and starting to think through, okay, an app for that. That's the the card game that I'm going to be relaunching one day, someday it used to be cross-linked. So an app for that card game, like how does an app for that even connect to an app for that, that recursive nature? So if somebody has bought the card game, how do we encourage them to buy it for a friend or share it with a friend? How do we even connect people to people that have the card game? How do we somehow connect them? Like how would that, so, so it kind of actually came up with a question on, or possibility there on how people that are playing the card game can connect. Um, let's say, so Instagram, uh, skip Instagram, um, the newsletter. So probably within an app for that, we should have a little card. It's like sign up for the newsletter, sign up for the happy hour. It's very cheap to add one extra card to the deck. That's like, here's some places you can go to learn more about OUX. All right. Um, came up with some other things just as I was pulling this together um, on how, from a marketing perspective, all these pieces could start feeding each other, which is something that we are really, um, we're lacking in right now. We have all the pieces there, which is beautiful, but right now it's it's not easy to get from one piece to the other piece, as you might have experienced joining the OUX world. Like there's happy hour, there's this other thing, there's this newsletter, there's a Udemy course. Even like, what's the difference between the Udemy course and the masterclass? What's the difference between the self-paced masterclass and the certification? We're not doing a great job of connecting those dots yet, but. Light at the end of the tunnel, we're going to get there. And this is going to be a big way that we're going to do that. This is this, y'all, this right here, this is our strategy. <laughs> this is basically our business strategy is we have all the things. Now it's time to start connecting them better. Okay. Numbing system objects. What? Okay. This is taking that nested object matrix up a level. So those were more like channels, but what about systems in it, like in a macro system, you're trying to do some sort of system design. This is, I'm uh, 
nodding my head at Cheryl Kababa right now, the author of System Design, who spoke at OUX Happy Hour and really got me thinking when I was reading her book and listening to her talk, thinking about system design and not only how system design thinking could help with OUX, but how OUX can actually help with system design. And one of the things I was thinking about is that's an object matrix. So I wrote a newsletter on this. So this might be repetitive if you follow the newsletter. Um, if you don't follow the newsletter, oux.com slash newsletter. Ah, just connected happy hour to newsletter. Um, let's take a macro system of single use plastics. This is the one I talked about in the newsletter. Again, this is the original um, <laughs> sketch, uh, 25 minute brainstorm of just thinking, okay, single use crack plastics, big ass problem we've got, all right? What are the systems inside that? What are the systems that contribute to that? And just a little bit of brainstorming. We got we got throwaway culture. We've got recycling uh, collection and processes. We've got the recycled materials market. We've got laws and legislation. I mean, there's so many more, but I just wanted to play with these. Okay, then I take it down the y-axis too, which I didn't do, but I now here that 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 looks better. Okay, and so many interesting questions came up. So this was all I came up with no solutions. I, all I did was come up with so many blind spots of like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about that being a question. Just through thinking about how these things intersect with each other. So um, even thinking about like, these recursive relationships, so the recycled material market to the recycled material market got me thinking about competition. So what is the competition like if Patagonia makes a recycled materials sweater? Does is Columbia pressure to do that? How does that work? Um, the recycling collection process and throwaway culture, I don't even know, like if I just was starting like to think about this problem, like, like how much is recycling collection and processing a business? Are these private entities? I think that they might be private entities. Do they rely on throwaway culture <laughs> to basically run their business? Is there actually a conflict of interest there? So big old questions came up, little questions about how even like laws and regulations work, like our recycling collection process center, like, are they allowed to just throw stuff away? I I don't know. Like, is that against the law? I take number two, pro number five plastic is going to get thrown away anyway, right? But if I take number two plastic and the recycling center is just like overwhelmed right now, are they allowed to throw this stuff away? I hadn't thought of that before. It took this matrix to help me think about questions that I could go and do further research on. All right. So, what about systems? I'm going to give you all some ideas to take the nested object matrix home with you and play with it. And please let me know how it goes. So what about systems at your organization? Could you do a nested object matrix on that? All right. Internal systems. What about in your body? This is an interesting one. If you have multiple health issues going on, y'all try this. Write me. Let me know how it goes. If you have multiple health issues, thinking about the interactions between those health issues could help you come up with questions for your doctor um, or whatever healer you're working with. Um, could come up with research questions for your Googling, <laughs> right? But like, how do these things interact with each other? Ah, that's an interesting one. In a city, oh my gosh. If you're doing any kind of city planning, like at a, at a government level, at, like thinking about how transportation and waste management and park systems and school systems, how do they all work together? Doing a nested object matrix, I think, would just be gold. Okay, another way, another thing. Nomming process steps. What? Process steps are linear. What? Okay, they are linear, but they're not that linear. So I started playing with this. On, I was, I've been on a plane a lot. And on the plane, I was like, what would happen if I put Orca into a nested object matrix? Do you know me? You know I love meta stuff. So I took Orca and I took the discovery steps. O-R-C-A, O-R-C-A. And I started figuring out how they all talk to each other. And this is, I teach this in the master class, but I have to teach it linearly because I have to teach one step after the other, after the other, after the other. And sometimes I reference previous steps, but I can't really reference future steps because they don't know about those. If you're taking the master class, you don't know about the future step yet. So this is something I'm doing for the advanced certification because they already know all the steps. So I can start saying, how do these steps influence each other? How do they play into each other? All right. This is not a linear process. <laughs> it, we are we are humans bound by time, but it is. I'm always thinking about the other pieces of the process when I'm on one step of the process, and this also helped me think about some blind spots. So here's just the discovery, orca by orca. Um, I ended up pulling this into Notion, of course, so you can see. Okay, I've got a step, and here's all the steps that could impact this step. 
All right. So one that I do talk about, if you've taken the course, you've probably heard me say this. I think I talk about this in the Udemy course as well, about as you're going through CTA discovery, as you're going through the nested, uh, <laughs> the CTA matrix, it's very common that new objects will come up. So you have an object like an event, right? Right. You're going to have, and you have a call to action for review. All right. Once you have a CTA review, you're also going to want a uh, object a review. So you're going to want to go back to object discovery or your list of objects. You're going to probably want to go back to your nested object matrix and add review in and explore all the relationships between all the other objects in this new object that you just came up with. So often, you know, you have a person, you add a message CTA. Well, we're going to need a message object too, because it's got structure, instances, and purpose, right? All right. So other process steps that you could think of, this is, this was freaking gold doing this for the ORCA process. I can imagine this doing this for a journey map. You've got that journey map along the x-axis, throw it down the y-axis too, and see how those journey map steps interact with each other. See what you get, just play with it. Um, a key standard operating procedure that you have within your work, within your business, there's a key SOP, take the steps and see what happens. Is there actually a better order of those steps? Do they impact each other in some way? Series of screens and a task flow. Try it. Okay. Woo. We're gonna go, we're gonna speed up here. Nomming team, people instances. How do teams and people work together? Where should they be connecting more? What aspects of team and people are actually working truly solo? So this is the OUX org chart. <laughs> but I'm just gonna I'm not gonna get into this because I could talk like 20 minutes on this, but y'all. Organizing your people, your people, organizing your uh, your teams by object could be a very, very beautiful thing. And then you could see literally how teams would intersect with each other and how teams would work together. But this doesn't have to be, this is showing how objects would intersect and then how the teams that run those objects would then intersect. This could just be by project. So I did this, this was again, like in a moment of stress of like, okay, I've got, and I have a very small team. It's myself, Lindsay, Marisa, and Luke. And so I did a People matrix of wait, who is working on what together? <laughs> Who's collaborating? Who's got solo stuff? Are there any gaps? And this was really, really helpful for me to kind of get a better idea on where the collaboration is happening. Now, if you have people working in threes and fours, and this kind of breaks down a little bit, but I think it would really be very helpful. So you have the leads and then who is assisting. Okay, game component instances. I just did this one. So I love game design. How do the game bits, how do they work together? We can brainstorm new new games with existing pieces and mapping out instructions. And that's what happened when I did this nested object matrix for um, a game that I designed two weekends ago with tarot. So I was playing with my tarot cards and I wanted to design a collaborative uh, fortune telling game, or basically a game that can help people bring people closer together through tarot. Um, so I played around with it. So I already had played around with the cards and then I put the components. So I didn't spell that out for you, but I got player one, player two, the major arcana and the minor arcana as the things across the top and along the side, and then how they all interact with each other helped me actually map out how I would describe this to somebody and how I would teach it. It actually helped me map out the order of operations for instructions. Didn't even expect that to happen. All right, so a few more nomming ideas, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Luke to go over. This is like the cherry on top. <laughs> I think like probably one of the coolest ones. So don't go anywhere, stay with us. Self-development, doing this an object matrix of your underlying beliefs. If you started if you started identifying those, which I have, um, and I did do this, but it's very personal, so I'm not gonna show it to you right now. Um, doing this an object matrix, how do they talk to each other? How do your underlying beliefs whip each other up into a froth, right? Um, actual content objects, like articles, videos. This is like the obvious one. It's like, oh, here's all of our main blog posts, the blog post that we did this month. Let's do all of our blog posts on the x-axis and the y-axis and see what ones need to mention each other. Um, hobbies or interests, how might they intersect or talk to each other? So like, if you're really into cooking and you're really into like being outside and hiking and, um, and, and being in nature, maybe maybe like a book on foraging would be something that would be really cool for you. So like, how can your, how can your hobbies and your interests actually come together and talk to each other and blend um, that I like, I'm like so excited. I would love to do that. Like I might do that tonight, <laughs> do all my hobbies and do a nom with my hobbies. Goals. How can goals support each other? Do any of your goals conflict? 
and fiction characters. So I'm going to hand this over to Luke. We're going to go over how this works with fiction characters. So I'm going to pop into this real quick and I'm going to go on mute and I'll, Luke, if you want to go off mute and talk through this. Absolutely. These, um, these are two of my characters in my graphic novel, and I'll give you a little more background on that in just a second. But, uh, but uh, we've got Tess, who's like an analog for, uh, for a modern analog for Nikola Tesla and uh, Bigfoot. And I have how Tess interacts with Tess, how Tess interacts with Bigfoot. And uh, it show, this basically shows at the beginning of the story um, how the character interacts with the other character. And then at the end of the story, how how that relationship um, you know finds its its conclusion, and that that represents basically the character arc um, for that character uh, throughout the whole story, and then in between the plot points um, that that form that that relationship, the, the plot points that take them there, and um, I did this for every person, place, and thing in the story. And it's been really helpful. So here, Bigfoot, this is how Bigfoot interacts with Bigfoot. This is how he feels about himself at the beginning and how he feels at the end. Um, it really has helped me sort of map out how these characters, um, like, like I said, their, their character arc. So like maybe one character's arc is finding acceptance. One character's arc is finding um, self-esteem. One character's arc is like accepting the mantle that he's been given. And um, uh, doing this this matrix has really, really helped with that. But if, if you have, um, can you switch over to me? Yeah, I'm talking. Put yourself on me. Okay. We're echoing. <laughs> okay. The one thing that I wanted to add before we go into Luke's air table is, wait, do I have anything to add? Maybe I don't. I think he said everything. But basically, what we're doing here is what Luke has been doing here is saying like, how does a relationship evolve? And so each cell, the nested object matrix is showing actually a little bit of a linear path, but it's like, okay, this is how Bigfoot feels about Tess. And I want to just want to show like both sides about like how it is different. Cause I think that's something that can be really confusing in a nested object matrix. So this cell right here, oh wait, am I pointing at the right thing? I'm not. Okay. This cell right here shows, okay, this is how Bigfoot feels about Tess at the beginning of their relationship. And this is how Bigfoot feels about Tess at the end of the relationship. And then what Luke's doing is mapping what plot points help that relationship evolve, bring the, bring the, the reader through the story arc. This one, on the other hand, is how Tess feels about Bigfoot at the beginning, and then how Tess feels about Bigfoot at the end and the plot points that get that get us there. And then these cells over here is that recursive relationship, which lets you explore, just I'm just echoing what Luke said, lets you explore how a person feels about themselves at the beginning, which is very important as an author to know how does that character actually feel about themselves, and then how do they feel about themselves at the end? Right. So maybe like Tess, for example, feels very um, uh, feels very self-conscious. She lets herself be abused. But by the end, she's a competent heroine. All right. So and she has uh, she has a new sense of self-worth or something like that. All right. So I'm going to mute myself and let you go into your air. Table. OK, I'm going to open up my air table. And um, like Sophia said at the beginning, um, I'm Luke. I'm her husband. Um, I work with her here at Rewired. And um, she's like our, she's like our band front man. And I'm like the roadie in the back that's keeping the special effects from burning her hair off. Um, <laughs> I, I manage the website and um, the automations and uh, a lot of the customer service and do illustrations and that sort of thing for us. Make OOUX swag like her um, awesome OOUX Tumblr some of you might've caught during the, uh, during her presentation. Okay, so um, just a little background on my silly uh, project here. I, uh, I enjoy uh, reading and learning about uh, conspiracy theories and hidden history and government cabals and the truth in mythology and the Illuminati and flat earth and stuff like that. And uh, I, th I think it's super fun. And so I started weaving uh, together this story that incorporates uh, a lot of those elements or as many as, of those elements as I could. 
Um, uh, another uh, thing behind this is, is when I was a kid, my dad used to tell me and my siblings um, uh, these kind of spooky sci-fi stories about this dog named Sparky. Um, and, uh, you know, when we were riding around in the car at night and, uh, and Sophia's dad actually also used to tell her stories about historical figures, but he's, he's a, a, a Polish man with a very thick Polish accent. And so he would tell her stories about Joan of Arc and Magellan and that sort of thing. But Joan of Arc became Joanne Dark uh, with his accent. And that, that inspired me. So with my uh, conspiracy theories um, story, uh, the main characters are like historical figures. And I went with Joanne Dark. I've got Tess Nichols, who's like a Nikola Tesla um, analog. I've got Zachary Fig, who's like a Isaac Newton analog and Bigfoot. And uh, their main antagonists are the reptilians who unmask themselves on TV um, early on in the story. So um, this is my air table. I've got all my people. It's very simple. It's got my people, places, and things, all the, the characters, all the places that they, that they go in the story, and uh, the things, the two things that, that I have in my story. And uh, here's the relationships. And how I'm doing it is you have like Tess Nichols, the, the, the host object, and how she interacts with each one of the other objects. And her relationship here at the beginning, this is her first impression of the, of the object or person or place, and this is her end state. And so this, the, the change between these two columns represents her character arc um, as far as that story element is concerned. And then I also have the plot points where they interact. So during, in this relationship, how Tess Nichols uh, interacts with the flat earth, for instance. And um, these are the plot points where she interacts with that story element. Um, and I bought, so here's the, the, all the plot points. And um, mapping this out has been really, really helpful for me um, with this. I, I, I had all the makings for this great story, like kind of bump, bumbling around in my head. And, uh, and I tried writing it out and I tried storyboarding it, but really the thing that's helped me organize it all and solidify it and turn it into a coherent narrative is this object matrix. And it, it did that. Uh, the first, the first thing it helped me do was, was find plot holes. So like, um, I have this plot point. I had this plot point in my head that with this great mental imagery of Bigfoot, he goes after this MacGuffin uh, artifact to, to help defeat the reptilians at the end. And I ha there's this great scene where he's, he travels to Egypt and he, he goes down the Nile and he travels to the Valley of the Kings and breaks into this tomb to, to get the artifact. And I realized in, in writing all this out with, and, and doing this plot matrix that there wasn't really any reason for him to go there. Like, why is he, how does he even know it's there, first of all? And, and, and why is he going there? And what's his relationship with this, with this MacGuffin? So um, it, the, the Matrix helped me realize I needed that backstory. And I came up with this, uh, in, in playing with the Matrix, I came up with this whole backstory about Enkidu based on the, the, uh, the mythology from Mesopotamia um, and the story of Enkidu, which is about a wild man who falls in love with a human woman. And, and so I came up with this whole backstory for Bigfoot having this love affair with this woman in uh, Queen Nefertiti's um, court. And that was why he, he knew the history of Egypt and to go back there. Um, and so I've, I've had several uh, plot points like that close up uh, with this matrix. It really has tightened up the storytelling for me. Um, it's also helped me um, create characters that I didn't even know I needed. Um, let me see if I can find Paloma Blanca. So I had um, one of the one of the plot points is that the reptilians they they round up all the intellectuals and they put them in camps. And Tess is one of those intellectuals, Nikola Tesla. And I had to figure out why why is she how does she get caught? How does she get rounded up in the first place? 
And the real life story of Nikola Tesla, I don't know if, if you know it, um, it's kind of tragic. At the end, he was like this sad old man um, who was kind of broke and he had, didn't have any friends. And he befriended this white, supposedly befriended this white pigeon uh, that he would feed out the window of his New York apartment. And so playing with the with the matrix and thinking about all that, thinking about my notes on the character and that sort of thing, uh, because I'm I'm keeping track of like real world facts about the characters here in this tab. Um, thinking about that kind of helped me come up with this character of Blanca Paloma, which actually means white pigeon. Um, but she's this she's this great villain um, who is working with the reptilians against against humanity. So she's kind of like just complete narcissist out for herself and she's involved with with Nikola Tesla uh, the Tess Nichols character and I, I never would have thought of her without this this plot matrix I think um, so that's another aspect and the and the I think the final thing that this thing is helping me with is um, is ordering the story so I have a lot of plot points that take place uh, in ancient history and even like like 30 years prior to the to the events in the in the to the main events in the story and i wanted to instead of you know one of the storytelling um truisms is to is to show not don't tell show don't tell so i uh instead of like just lecturing and giving this long monologue about you know the ancient history um of of how bigfoot became bigfoot or then that sort of thing I wanted to like kind of break it up uh, throughout the story and put it in at opportune points, you know, when the, when the reader needs to know and doing this has really helped, like just having all my plot points here like this and being able to sort them and move them around and, and put them in place uh, where I want them has been super helpful. So doing this has, has helped me organize my thoughts, um, and 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 also prioritize a lot of stuff i've thrown i've thrown stuff out that made no sense i mean a lot of this stuff makes no sense but it's it's still uh i've been able to form a, co a coherent narrative with this and throw out things i didn't need um and find things that i that i i didn't know i needed and um and really knit together a a, a really coherent narrative and, and now that i've i've filled this out you know i'm, I'm just i'm like I'm kind of smoothing the rough edges and I've got a, a super coherent, like high granularity um, outline for this graphic novel. And, that, and, and once I'm satisfied with this, I'll be able to move back to my uh, storyboarding phase and really like make some progress. So the nested object matrix, voila. All right, so Luke, you have at least four people that really want to read this book. <laughs> so you you have your your audience awaits. Um, so that is all we have for you today. Uh, hopefully, this one was kind of like fun and different um, and inspiring. Um, can you stop screen sharing? Yeah. Cool. So we can see people. People. And hopefully, you're thinking about ways that you can potentially use an SN object matrix. So um, any questions? We are a little bit, if you have a meeting, hey, West Coast people, if you have another meeting, it is three o'clock for the West Coast. You got to go to that. We'll hang out. If you do have, do y'all have any questions? Do you have any comments? Do you have any ideas on how you might think about using the nested object matrix? We would love to hear it. And we'll hang out for a minute to see if there are any questions or comments. <laughs> John, family relationships before Thanksgiving. That is an amazing one. Yes. I got everybody in your family like, who's not talking to who? <laughs> who needs to sit at opposite ends of the table? Yes. <laughs> See, it could apply in so many ways. Um, awesome. Any questions? Cool. Ah, yes. Discount code for those that stayed to the end. Not going to say it, only for those that are here live. And that is what, till like the end of the day on Friday or something? Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's for end of the day of Friday, $100 off the self-paced masterclass. If you are waiting to join a cohort, you're going to be waiting a while. Probably the next cohort is not going to be until next summer. So go ahead and get started on the, the self-paced masterclass. 
Um, so many people say, I'm so glad I did the self paced masterclass first because it gave me this really nice head start for the rigorous certification process. So anyways, happy OUXing y'all. Let us know if you have any questions. We'll be posting this recording to YouTube and to the forum and uh, we can continue the conversation there. All right, cheers y'all.